Diane, I'm listening to a podcast, Black Lodge Trivia Night. I've never heard so many game aspirations in my life. Hello and welcome back to Black Lodge Trivia Night. We have a special little something for you tonight. It may be a glorious new thing, and it also might be a disaster. I highly doubt that, because it's something that Art and I are both very passionate about, and that is, uh, I guess, I, I sometimes I don't like the term Soulsborn, but we've teased this for so long. We're finally talking about our love and appreciation of the world that is the From Software games. So welcome to the very first episode of Bonfire Walk With Me. Yeah, uh, this is very exciting. We obviously, if you followed any of our streams, there have been basically nothing but Souls. Um, we have full playthroughs of multiple Souls games on our YouTube channel. Uh, we didn't put the audio up for those, um, but Matt and I no. are very, very big fans. Um, and Patrick doesn't know what he's in for when we shove no. down his throat. <laughs> no, I would... Uh... I'd be surprised if he ever, if you ever, if Patrick ever played a Souls, a Souls game of any kind, I'd be surprised. Does not seem like up his alley. Maybe it is, but I don't know. Is he even a video game player? I don't, I have no idea. Oh, I don't know. Maybe like Hearts of Iron or something like that. Mm, mm, something, something. So, so one of our other loves and passions is Twin Peaks, of course. So yep. in some kind of style, we will merge those two love interests. So maybe it'll be one week we're talking about Souls and the next week is a minute by minute recap of <laughs> blue velvet because doing twin peaks will be too obvious so let's do something that's only <laughs> elephant in man. true souls fashion you know what like there's this potential thread that connects this world and this world so let's just go full ham in it which is really the the from software experience isn't it, it absolutely yeah 100 percent. yeah like if you notice that gail is wearing a hat you will also notice that Yosefka is wearing a hat in Bloodborne. So mm. really, Dark Souls 3 is an imagination of... I'm, I'm fizzing. I lost it. <laughs> I had a thread and then it's gone. Perfect. <laughs> Good. So, so I think, should we do the... Well, I guess we have business first. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of our shtick. I don't know if it's a very good shtick, but I enjoy the shtick all the same. And that is we have trivia at the beginning of each RPG session. Now, it has nothing to do with RPGs. It's always about Twin Peaks. I guess we'll be on topic tonight, though. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of a curveball. But I figured we should start with some From Software trivia. Nice. Looking forward to it. Okay. So, what was the first game developed by From Software and what system did it launch? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm going to say... Wow. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to say Kingsfield 1, PlayStation 1. Yeah, yeah, easy. Oh, that's it? That's it. You got it. Oh, nice. Very nice. There we go. Yeah, I, so I've only... I, what was your first From Soft... Was your first From Software the Soulsborne games, or did you experience From Software before then? Because I, I actually, like, <laughs> a little bit of a hipster myself and got started a long time ago. Oh, so you were in before they were popular, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> um, kind of. <laughs> so here's the deal. When you had a PlayStation in 1997, like I did, when did the PS2 come out? PS2 came out in 99, right? Around then, yeah. 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 So we, we must have gotten it in 96, 97 or something like that. And we played Metal Gear Solid ad nauseum to death. But we also played until we wore grooves in that thing a demo disc that I think came from Pizza Hut. And if not, wherever it came from, it was solid. But you yeah. can only play the games for so long. So it had things like a Wave Racer, or not Wave Racer, Wave, no, Jet Moto. Mm -hmm. But you could only do three laps. So we would play Tag in Jet Moto, but we'd never finish three laps. So you get like two hours of fun out of a three lap. Anyways, right. one of the demos was Armored Core, and you could actually customize your mechs. Oh. inside that demo like it wasn't just like here's two max go and do it um you actually had a pretty good so i i don't know i assume it was just regular armored core not something like master of arena or project phantasma but anyways yeah that was my first from software experience so that's that's what i was trying to figure out like i, I wasn't sure if there was like some kind of armored core that preceded hmm. the kingsfield on the playstation one um that's that's what i was trying to 
figure out, but um, Armored Core is supposed to be quite good. Have you ever played any since then? Have you been a fan of that no. series? No. Okay. So I'll, I will play six uh, nice. here shortly. That is on my to-do list. Very nice. Um, did not play Armored Core 5 or anything like that, which was starting to come out during the heyday of of the Souls games, which is really what we're here to talk about. Because even though these games are not directly related, we are going to be talking about a specific series of games, which if you're listening to this podcast in 2024, I will assume you kind of know what they are, but not everyone does, and that's cool. But it's a very um, distinct type of game that I think a lot of game developers have tried to capture, but have failed to capture it directly. I think some have gotten close and made damn good games. Um, but they're usually pretty challenging. They usually have a world that kind of connects to itself. Uh, a lot of interconnectivity and beautiful world and level design. Uh, very innovative. Uh, lots of challenge, but a challenge that you can train up, like you can get good. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn the games and it's a very rewarding experience. And then, of course, typically some kind of progression towards a boss. You beat the boss and you have a waypoint system and you travel around and you get checkpoints before the boss and you just bash your head against that boss <laughs> until you beat him. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Yep. Simple, but brilliant. Absolutely. And innovative along the way. Um, which I think is stuff will like multiplayer things like that. I'm sure we'll get into. Um, really did some interesting things from the jump, and and also interesting from how it presents itself from a lore perspective. Uh, Tomb Raider, the the one that came out on PS3, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, ten years ago, is one of my all time favorite games. And just as a counterpoint, like that story is so overt. There's not a lot of like hidden clues. Soulsborne games. Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Bloodborne, all of those use environmental storytelling as well as like subtle storytelling. If you look at someone sitting in a chair, that that person is probably there for a reason. Now, sometimes it may just be filler, but they may be strapped there or something like that, and you, or they may hold a particular item. Like there is such subtle storytelling that just trust the players to pay attention instead of just spoon feeding everything. And I think the lack of spood feeding is like a characteristic of the entire series, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one, I think that's can be frustrating, but if yeah. you're willing to go with it or acknowledge that maybe you're not going to get it now, but later on you can look it up and piece it together. Uh, yeah. Incredibly rewarding. Absolutely. So I, I, we could talk about like what the characteristics of a, of a dark souls, demon souls, whatever, a from software game is in, in 2024. But like I said, we're people have been talking about these games for a long time. They developed a, a strong cult following with Demon Souls mm -hmm. um, to the point where people were regularly importing Japanese copies before it got a localization in the US. And then of course Dark Souls. And eventually Demon Souls ended up on, on PS Plus. Yeah. Um, and then just building on that hype. And some point along the way, you and I found these series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Should we, you want to start off with how we. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can start. I can tell you, I was one of those people that imported a copy of Demon Souls. Oh, shit. Uh, it later came out on, like you said, PS Plus, but it was also, I think on the PlayStation 3, they had like a greatest hits series or something like that. Yep. And Demon Souls eventually got released that way as well here in the States. I don't know if there was an interim release where it was a full, full there was a there was an English localization but it might have been an EU copy because I have a non-greatest hits version of Demon's Souls on the PS3 that it, I yeah. must have been but this was long this was after I did not technically start with Demon's Souls um, anyways yeah going. so um, Demon's Souls is the reason why I bought a PlayStation 3 I had an Xbox 360 I had been an Xbox guy um, a PC gamer um and I came to discover Dark, uh, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, because the website GameSpot named Demon Souls their game of the year. And I was like, OK, usually I've at least heard of the game that you yeah. know, gets their top prize. And this one I didn't really know anything about. So I sort of watched and read their coverage. And it was namely the sense of um, place and art style that hooked hmm. me. You know, obviously gobs of screenshots and, and gameplay footage. And I was apprehensive at first because I was like, you know, I'm not an expert gamer. They keep talking about the challenge. 
I don't know if I'm up for beating my head against something, but I was like the, the setting, the art style, what they're trying to go for in their dark fantasy efforts really spoke to me. And so I was like, screw it. I, I had a, it was my first ever bonus from work. Um, the only, uh -huh. One of the few times I've ever gotten a bonus from a job. And I was, I talked to my wife and I was like, Hey, do you mind? You know, we, we need a Blu-ray player anyway. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And yeah. And she was like, yeah, go for it. And so, yeah, I bought a PlayStation three, imported a copy of demon souls and uh, spent 11 hours getting to the phalanx. Um, I was going to say, in the training area. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got through that, but it took me 11 hours to get to the boss of 1-1. And that was my, that's when I realized, oof, but uh, it also made me realize I was in. Yeah. So how about you? I think that's a common thread, right? Before, before we get to mine is this, at what, you know, at what point, you know, the common thread is demons, the real demon souls begins here. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, at some point your journey begins for real. And and what I mean by that is I think it's a common thread for players of these games to hit a point where it clicks and it's so rewarding. And I, I don't think once you capture it once now I could be wrong for you, but like once you beat Phalanx the first time, which is hilarious to me because Phalanx boss of one, one in demon souls, I was listening to today. I was listening to Bonfire Side chat, nice. and they were talking about how hard Phalanx was with a melee weapon. And I'm just like, I just put it two hand and applied the fire. the fire application and fucking stood in there and tink that <laughs> thing and made it my bitch. Like there was like, but you know, if I tried that as my first one, I probably would have got smoked repeatedly. Right, um, right. It's just it's just funny, but I think every, oh, that's a common thread now. My first introduction to Soulsborne was my brother playing Demon Souls. And I remember him telling me loosely about the alignment system, either mm. black or white, depending on what you do, who you kill, when you die. And then how, uh, you know, trophies were relatively new still to gaming. Um, you know, the PS3 did not launch with all of their games having trophies. Actually, it wasn't even a requirement for all their games to have trophies for I think until the end of the life of the system, because you get a PS3 game and it wouldn't have trophies. Oh, wow. Um, and he was telling me about like, there are some trophies, at least in the PS3 version that I think are completely luck based, like whether they drop or not mm. could be wrong, but that's at least at the time what we thought. And so he's telling me about this alignment and then how you can be online and people will invade you. And he's just like talking about how hard it is. And I think he was, it must've been like world two, two or something like that. I think he was like walking on a platform. And it was like dark and I was like, no, oh, no, not for me. <laughs> right. So I got a PS3 in college and eventually PS plus came out and like PS plus had a terrible start and <laughs> they kind of like made it up to players when all their information got hacked. And I think that's when, that's when you started getting the free stuff. And eventually demon souls was on there uh, and I downloaded it and I fired it up and I thought this is hot garbage. <laughs> do you remember the moment like was was there something specific that i didn't could... even i don't even think i made it to the the demon at the end of the training area it was like that bad i was like oof this is right so years go by and he he plays dark souls and i remember him telling me a, a lot about dark souls i know he played two and three but he didn't talk about it as much so eventually i get a ps4 and you know it's our, our it's our first apartment and get a ps4 and like you know we're young newlyweds so i'm trying to like save money so i'm like oh man this is amazing all these games are at the library and i can just get them at the library so i check my games out the library and checked out bloodborne fired it up and of course the first thing you do in bloodborne is walk down the stairs and you get torn to pieces by a dog <laughs> right. this game is a hot pile of shit why why do i keep <laughs> doing this to myself these games suck what do these people talk about uh, and then it was probably a couple years later. I don't even, I wish I remembered why. I don't think my brother revealed, and I think we're just going to be open with spoilers at this point. Maybe like, except for like the latest Elden Ring stuff, like all this stuff. Right. Um, but the spoiler alert for Elden Ring, there is a strong um, cosmic horror tie, Lovecraftian stuff. And I don't even think that's what he revealed to me, but I think he finally. Sorry, Elden Ring or Bloodborne? Bloodborne. Sorry. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, although there is some subtle some, yeah. in uh, Elden Ring, but Bloodborne is a Lovecraft story. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
and there must have been something that finally like all right and then he convinced me to stick with it and i did and i um the i can't even remember the boss's name the first one on the bridge is weak to fire and i think i saw a note that said they're weak to fire or my brother might have said like save your fire bombs and right. i beat that boss after a couple tries but i just firebombed him to death yeah and then you get to um father gascoigne oh yeah in the graveyard and i probably attempted him like 30 times <laughs> and the when i got him that was that moment yeah i was just like standing up i was just like holy shit if it, it finally happened and i um it was amazing so i played through and uh then i did a watch of epic name bros lore video on and that was a big reason why my brother liked dark souls so much is he would watch uh marcus's epic name bros videos he was a huge fan of epic name bro and so that might have been the reason why i finally came around on bloodborne but then i did a lore through and mm -hmm. did a play along with him after playing through bloodborne for the first time and it was just like an amazing experience yeah um so so two questions i, I just for the listeners i think the first boss is named the cleric beast right that's yeah cleric one. beast that's what yeah. it is Yep. Second, when you took on uh, Father Gascoigne, did you do it with the music box? Not at first. Okay. Not at first. I confess, I did not know about the first time I. Yeah. My my Bloodborne experience, I will say, is a little different, and this is a little scattershot, but we'll 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 get on a track in a bit. But Bloodborne, I actually have only played once, and I played it fully co-op. I have never played Bloodborne by myself. I played the entirety of that game in a very complicated way uh cooperatively so um, you only progress on one character though right so did you guys like trade back and forth did it all three times <laughs> so what we would do is because i think it i think that was the first game that included a password system yeah so you could sort of target who you wanted to come into your game and we would do it um lantern by lantern so we would Jesus. start here. I would pull my brother and my one of my closest friends in. We'd get to the next lantern. Say, okay, who's up next? Go back. Next person would get there. Stop. Yep. That's how I played Bloodborne. <laughs> and it was amazing, I gotta say. Genuinely amazing. It sounds amazing. I would love to experience it that, but the thought of going in and out at every lantern. Yes. And now I don't know if you know this, there is a mod being made for Elden Ring that allows seamless co-op start to finish. I thought that already existed. Is that not? Yes. I don't know what happened with it though when Shadows of the Earth Tree was released. I don't know oh, if that okay. jammed it up. So I don't want to speak like, yeah, just go out and get it because I don't know exactly what stage it's at. But hmm. having experienced Bloodborne start to finish in co-op, I wish That's them crazy. luck because it's amazing and that sort of takes away a lot of the headaches um, that I... I think those games would be an awesome start to finish co-op experience. And I wish, I hope someday that is possible as a, as a standard feature. <laughs> it's wild that you guys did it. And so Bloodborne, and I, I remember the first moment I came out of the church and my insight got high enough. So there's like, there's several moments, right? Like Father Gas going, holy shit. And then, like, getting weapons, um, like the fucking wagon wheel or the giant <laughs> cannon. I was like, this is amazing. Or getting sick armor or, like, um, even just, like, things from, like, the first shortcut you unlock or, mm -hmm. um, like, oh, oh, my gosh, what's his name? Oh, the leader of the school, Wilhelm, is sitting there in the chair and he's just pointing out into the lake. And you're just supposed to you take a leap of faith. Yeah. And there you jump into the lake. And I think by that time, you're, it's been so long since I've done a complete playthrough. Your insight is high enough that you kind of know. There's definitely enough like lore stuff. Although in my first playthrough, I wasn't picking up on that stuff. And you just jump down there and you're like, what the fuck am I fighting? <laughs> um, and at that point, it's not super eldritchy because it's just like a big spider. But it's just like, what the fuck? Um, but yeah, walking on the church and your insights high enough, and all of a sudden you see this eldritch monster is just wrapped around the healing church, and you're just like, Yep. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, I remember again, we were playing it cooperatively. I I don't know if I would have known to do that, except I think we were having an issue with something, and I was like, okay, let me just look it up really quickly. And then 
when I was doing that, something said like, hey, make sure you get your insight up to 30 or 40 or whatever it is. Game's going to get harder, but... I think it's 25. 25, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, okay, guys, um, this is the answer to what we're looking for. But at some point, let's... Because I think you can burn something to up your insight, right? There's yeah. Like a, mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. so I was like, if umbilical, we have enough... Well, not the umbilical cords, but yes, there's some... Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, let's all get our insight up to 25 because apparently something happens. They're like, oh, okay. And then it was the same, like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Let me, yeah. let me ask you a quick question. So Bloodborne was your first experience. Demon Souls before that had been like, you know screw this, this game's a wreck, it's too hard, whatever it might have been. Right. I know that you're a fan of Eldritch Horror. Was that what pulled you through getting over the difficulty hump, or was there something else? It was was that satisfaction of beating Father Gascoigne. Okay. And then, like, my brother and stuff, like, talking about how good the game was, and, like, telling me, like, you're gonna love the reveal. Yeah. You're gonna love the reveal. So I was already hooked before the cosmic horror stuff revealed itself got it and then i was just like oh fuck yeah and then i found out that epic name bro had his lore through so i was like all right let's let's get as far as we can and i don't i don't even think i beat the game um and if i did it wouldn't have been a very good ending but then i started a fresh run and just took it complete get everything right and reading the descriptions along hide with him and like seeing uh like going back behind Yosefka and stuff like oh, I'll yeah. never forget those moments and then you have like you have the, like the little fucking aliens back there which was also <laughs> like the first time I saw those I was like because I think that's also before the big reveal I'm like what the fuck <laughs> yeah yeah ah uh, uh, yeah I will say uh, Bloodborne might be one of my favorite cosmic horror stories oh easy yeah yeah, yeah. now you have not you did not I know you haven't read Between Two Fires yet not yet I have it up stairs yeah. but yeah i haven't read it cosmic e not as overt as you're probably not wrong um it's so damn good especially when and I, i'm a i do this because i'm i'm kind i'm a lazy gamer mm-hmm. i like the idea of reading the item descriptions but i'll be honest with you i don't like on an armor set if one gives me enough information i don't go check the legs and the and the right. arms and shit, but sometimes the legs will have a little bit more information. Yeah. So I watch a lot of lore videos. Um, yeah. And when I get Bloodborne told to me in one cohesive story, it's just like, what? It, it's so good. Right. And of course, I mean, a lot of Souls fans already know this, but if you're sort of discovering, if you listen to us and then you're like, what is this Souls thing you speak of, sir? Uh, bonfire side chat Matt's already mentioned is a uh, audio only very in-depth and then there's also Vadi Vidya and I'll put links to both of that stuff mm. in the show notes Vadi Vidya in particular does really polished videos that go into just a million different things um, and I'm sure there's others those are the ones that I'm most familiar with yeah um, the one that that hooked me and I do like body video and I like, I like bonfire side chat as a companion piece. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know if I'd start there, but no, uh, Epic name bro is, I'll say he's, he's fallen out of love, which is perfectly okay. Right? Like I'm not falling this at all, but his videos on from the dark, which he did, he was doing, dark souls content before dark souls content became like commercial right like before we did like he did he did from the dark almost 10 years ago i just checked the date um dark souls is 13 years old as of a month ago um and he worked on the strategy guide for dark souls 2 and the strategy guide for bloodborne and so his his playthrough of the bloodborne is uh, still one of my all-time favorite things. Like nice, very nice. Yeah, so I, I would recommend him. But but I will say he. I wouldn't say he's jaded. It's just I think where his gaming interests are, and I kind of want to talk about this at the at maybe after we talk about each of the games, give a little broad overview of them, and we have we have kind of a creative description for each of them that we're pulling from the internet. Um, is how do you see like from software now? Um, because I think it's a little divisive for some people. I think the vast majority love what they're doing, but um, for some people it never got better than dark souls. It was all downhill from there. 
Yeah, I um, you know, I was mentioning my friend that we co-opt Bloodborne together. I think he really enjoyed cosmic horror aspect to it, but I will tell you, he is somebody um that Dark Souls was the peak. I don't know if he ever went back and played Demon Souls. Um, I don't know, but I can tell you, like, I I don't know if he played. He must have played Dark Souls too, but I remember talking to him about Dark Souls three because we co-opted that, and he just um. He just said, yeah, like, you know, it's like, I, I just, I can't get over the things that they changed, namely, and something we've talked about in streams and off mic, uh, dropping the poise uh, mm. stat from Dark Souls 1. He was like, that was such a perfect mechanic. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I don't know if it was perfect. I don't know if it was perfect, but, you know, with all these, like, hyper frames or whatever they turned it into, and it was just like, it was, it was knowable, it was, it worked, and I wish they could. Yeah. And so when he played a souls game. Like when we weren't trying to get through a new one, uh, just past tense. He, he passed away. Um, that's why it's mm. always in the past tense. But, um, when he played one, just to go back and play one, it was always dark souls one. And it was one of two things that he liked to do. He liked to put down his sign and help new players get through, uh, cooperatively if they needed a hand, which I think is, if we get into the multiplayer either tonight or at some other point, that's one of the things I actually find really charming about uh, mm -hmm. it's not just the mechanics they put in place but it's the way the people the community kind of embrace them in a way absolutely uh and then the other thing is i think it's kind of unique to dark souls one well no 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 i shouldn't say that but uh the grave lords are one of the factions you can join and what you can do is if i understand this correctly you can sort of up the difficulty of somebody else's world but what they would do is what he would do is he would find people like that. He gamed a lot with that wanted just the hardest challenge they could come up with. Mm -hmm. And so they would agree to sort of grave Lord each other's worlds. They would <sighs> take it to like new game pluses. I don't know how far. And then they would grave Lord each other and just let the other guy experience this intense difficulty. And then, uh, yeah, they'd swap it up. And that was one of the things that, again, mm -hmm. it, it's actually it's, it, uh, its own form of co-op. Sure. By another name. Right. Um, yeah. In this case. And I don't know if, I mean, some some of that may just be as we do our own little playthrough of, of each game zone by zone, right? That's right. on that's on the agenda now. <laughs> um, we can talk about those mechanics because it it is all it generally works very similar across the the spectrum, but there are little nuances and differences. Generally, um, you'll see summon signs, and you can bring people in to help or to harm. Right. Or you can get invaded. Um, yeah. So, or or in Dark Souls 3, they can come in as a, are they going to kill you or are they going to help you? Right, you don't know. Which was a cool concept when people didn't know. Like now when I see a purple person and, or like their signs, like, oh, you're fucking dead, man. Like you're toast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I don't know how unique these mechanics are, but like, yeah, matches sort of encapsulate. You can use these signs. They act as portals between, you know, your games uh, when with Dark Souls, uh, sorry, with Bloodborne, they introduced passwords so you can, you know, pick and choose who you brought in. But it's always these sort of passing mm. interactions that you ring a bell in Dark Souls. That's oh, what it's because I, I was like, Bloodborne. man, I never really got invaded in Dark Souls. It's because I never rang my fucking bell. Right, right. That's why yeah. it wasn't a summon sign, but yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you ring your bell. And then that makes you eligible, and then you can pull people in. Um, my understanding is that mechanic. I think, and Miyazaki, I think, saw a group of people, I think somebody's car was either stuck in a, in a snowbank or in mud, something like that. And what he saw was a bunch of people pull off the road and help get this car free. And then they drove off. And in his mind, it was like, he just saw this as like this really interesting where a bunch of people came together for this moment, helped each yeah. other through. And then they went on their way. dissipated. And I, I think that is part of the the origin story of how he approached multiplayer for I guess Demon Souls would have been the first one that he did that. I don't I doubt Kingsfield had multiplayer. No, not not Yeah. Not like that, right? Um Yeah, if that's not the origin story, it should be. They should just adopt that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just can have that Miyazaki. Me, no, I I could have swore I just read that recently. I don't know where. Um, but, but yeah, I, so, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, there's going to be lots of tropes that we talk about as, as we do this series, because I hope this is a continuing, ongoing thing. Even when we're, when we're being, like, lazy and we're doing tier lists or, or yeah. you know, top lists or whatever, like, it's still a fun conversation, but we're going to talk about these tropes, because what's amazing is how much is they can be their own distinct world. But the joke I made about the connection between Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 and Demon Souls and tying them all together, like, I say that as a joke, but it's not... I'm not completely blowing smoke up your ass. Like there's, there's a little something to that. Now, some of it is from software reuses a lot of assets. Mm -hmm. um, so like there's a lot of weapon similarity, a lot of model similarity, but sometimes that model similarity is very intentional. Right. Um, and there's a lot of, because of this open ended interpretation of these worlds we're in, the story we're presenting, it allows for, you know, that's another selling point. It's not this, you need to relink the flames and that's the good ending the quote-unquote good ending maybe the bad ending right you know like there's right. there's so much open-endedness to all of it um and that's that's really good and i think one of the most impressive things for me is so we're gonna talk about demon souls dark souls dark souls 2 ish <laughs> bloodborne dark I, I lost count demon souls dark souls dark souls 2 Bloodborne, Demons, Dark Souls 3, Elden Ring, and Sekiro. Seven games over 15 years. Plus stuff in between that. They had Armored Cores releasing. At some point, we'll talk about Armored Core 6, I assume. But yeah. they also had like Armored Core 5. Let, let me look at the wiki. But my point is, you're releasing a game every two years, and... Even if we did a tier listing of the Soulsborne games, like, what's the lowest grade you would give? You've played all of them, correct? Except you've only messed around with Sekiro? I've only, yeah, glanced against Sekiro, yeah. Okay, so I've not played Dark Souls 2. But, like, what's the lowest grade you would give any of those main seven? A B at low. Right, low. I mean, that's that's my point. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, for me, I don't know if any of them are below an A, but I haven't played two. Right. Um, and that's what's crazy. You're putting out two games or a game every two years and then to like put a cap on it all with Elden Ring, right. <laughs> like right. one of the most ambitious game designs ever. <laughs> like it's so yeah, fascinating and it's so um, it's really an impressive journey. Yes, absolutely. On so many levels from a storytelling and creativity to a, a linkage from a from a world design from like where we are to a level design of how you open this gate and you walk out and you're back home. And it's like, Whoa, I didn't even know. And uh, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's just, it's really cool. It's, it's truly stunning. Yeah. Cause like you were describing, it's been a hell of a run in turn. Like I, I don't love dark souls too, but I, I can't sit there and say like, Oh, it sucks. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the thing. And so like all these games are, for what they and, and you forget they're all good and, and you forget how at least it's easy to forget now because you just described there's so many of them in a, in a sense from one company there's other <laughs> games that are sort of spinning off a little bit i i have to make sure i remind myself just how innovative i found demon souls when it first came out um, yeah it did things that because i never played kingsfield i had never experienced before it incorporated multiplayer that i thought was fascinating storytelling techniques that i never encountered in a video game, just so much stuff all in one. I was just, it just opened my eyes to what the medium could do. Yeah. And that's how I felt about Bloodborne. I mean, really, when you start to see how they're telling the story and then it starts to click. And if that's your jam, then yeah, it's so innovative. Now I understand that I came in 10 years into that or whenever Bloodborne came out, but still to me, it was just like, whoa, this is like nothing I've ever seen. Six years. Bloodborne came out in 15. Wow. So, there was a quiz you shared. Yes. And I'll not put a the... quiz, but basically like a, a, a Cosmo quiz. And yeah, this yeah. was written by Ab Abigail Longy, published on The Gamer, mm -hmm. uh, just at the beginning of this month, October 2024. And it was titled, What Your Favorite Soulsborne Game Says About You. So, I figured we could pull out some of the interesting tidbits, maybe go back and forth. I'll start with Demon Souls. And mm -hmm. then maybe we can guess, um, like who the other one identifies the most with maybe it's not your favorite but and then and then obviously reveal the one we identify the most with and then maybe talk about our favorites and then we can just kind of go from there what do you think yeah that sounds great 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Demon Souls came out, uh, like I said, I think I said it came out in 2009, and then it got a remake on the PS5, which is amazing. Uh, yeah. It is so visually impressive from a graphic standpoint uh, in, in 2020. And here's if uh, if Demon Souls is your favorite, you're the intellectual. <laughs> Look at you, a diamond in the rough. You're a lover of the underappreciated and enjoy the simple things in life. Clever, decisive, and insightful, devoted slayers are a rare but very present kind among the Soulsborne community. As an individual, you're sincere. You might not always say much, but when you do have something to say, it's important. You're charismatic, knowledgeable, and cut your own path through life and its challenges. So, I love everything that I've seen so far in, in Demon's Souls. And I'm not, I'm not trying to reveal anything here. What What is interesting is the line about when it has something to say, it, it like says it well. Mm -hmm. Is that like a lore thing? Because the, the lore... Demon Souls feels the most video gamey to me. I mean, they're all video games. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a little right. less like nuance and more bad guys go smash. Yeah, it's it's that and something that I appreciate about it that they've sort of gotten away from more as the series went on is it's it's more. The thing that struck me is very video game is a lot of the bosses are very puzzly. Hmm. Like it's sort of like a like a. I don't want to say one trick, but it's not like the current set of bosses. It's like, you know, super fast paced, hard hitting duels. But there it was like the boss is going to have a gimmick that you need to exploit. And to me, mm. it felt a little bit like how like a Metroid or something might give you a boss and you have to hit the mouth three times to pop the eye open to, you know what I mean? I don't know if that's actually a Metroid boys boss, but you know what I mean? Sort of that old vibe of like, yeah, yeah. What I, and maybe this is just I need to spend more time with the game. But like today I was looking up Phalanx, right? Mm -hmm. Phalanx is the first boss and you have to beat Phalanx before the kind of trope, before you go level up. Right. Uh, you go spin your souls. Um, The boss is not the shield wall. There is a the soul of a person, although it's just, they're kind of a sludge now, inside of that Phalanx. And they were the king's archer. And they were kind of a scaredy cat and hid behind the shield walls and like would never engage in combat. Right. Um, and that is less all of the little tidbits about bosses like that and all the souls born games, all of that is in item descriptions or through subtle nuance, but it even feels like more hidden away, more tucked away, even less obvious in demon souls where it seems to be less of a point. So I'm curious to see how much of that story how much I engage with the story of my first play through Demon Souls. Yeah, it is interesting. You were saying like it, it's well said. I, I confess that um, oh, when you have something to say, it's important. Um, I guess that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, clever, decisive, insightful, devoted slayers are rare, but very present. Um, I, I, I will say the sincerity part, because it's if your favorite is Demon Souls, I feel like it takes a very sincere approach to think that because you could argue that every game afterwards is iterated on it for the mm -hmm. better, for the most part. Fair. So, um, for, so if you truly love that, I feel like that is true. Um, yeah. All right. What's, what's the next one? Next one is dark souls. And, yep. um, which I, I have to say, I, I really like this article. Um, not just because it was the first Cosmo quiz I could relate to, but I just thought it was a really fun. <laughs> Is it? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a Samantha. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm a Rachel. Uh, let me see. Uh, so yeah, for dark souls, the next game chronologically, she says you're a traditionalist and an old soul, an upstanding purist and probably a lover of the classics. You like routine and are not very open to change, but you're tough as nails and your values are stronger than iron. You usually don't let your emotions get the better of you, and you may seem pretty stoic and cold on the outside, but on the inside, you can be a real softy. <laughs> so I will say, like, my friend that I was describing, uh, that's him to a T. Uh, yeah, he liked Dark Souls was his first one that he played. It did things in a way that absolutely made sense to him. He clicked with it, and any deviation from that as the series went on, he was just <laughs> like, you guys already cracked this. Um... And, and the rest of it's stoic, yeah, yeah, a lot of that stuff too. Uh, but, and through him, I encountered other players that 
had that similar mindset. So I, I definitely feel like this article nails the Dark Souls mm. favorite fan uh, pretty well. Nice. Well, the next one, I'll just have to take the word for it. Mm. That's Dark Souls 2. If you if that's your favorite, you're a headstrong rebel. You go against the grain and don't care what people think or say about you. You stand by what you believe in and never back down in a fight. You don't let anything stand between you and your goals and will do what it takes to come out on top. Your passion might be mistaken for a hot temper, and you're always probably a bit of a masochist with a panache for the grueling challenge every playthrough of your favorite game brings. Dark Souls 2 is criticized for its sheer, merciless, unforgiving journeys from bonfires to boss arenas, as well as its questionable place in the Dark Souls timeline. So <laughs> there's two things that turn me off about Dark Souls 2. One, the journeys of the bosses, which I've always heard about. Mm-hmm. Another thing, I was, re- I was looking it up recently because I was like, should I go play Dark Souls 2? My concern is, and this is what the most common complaint was, is that it just feels off from like a combat perspective. Like your combat swing is one second too longer or, or like something like that, which if you've never played these games, you're just like, who cares? Yeah. But like you get used to it, which is why Phalanx is probably so easy to me. And, and Shield Knight, um, Shield Knight, I did pretty damn good with. Uh, Iron Spiders gave me a little bit, of, gave me a little bit of a challenge last night. That's as far as I am in Demon Souls. Okay. But um, I think the reason that translates so well is because like I'm hot off Dark Souls 3. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm worried that it's like, I won't like it because it'll feel wrong. Uh, yeah. So just to him, Black Lodge trivia night. Like I said, yeah. we have playthroughs of many of the Souls games. Um, I I recorded a playthrough of Dark Souls 2, which I think of the ones I've completed is my least favorite. <laughs> um, so you'll find it amusing when I tell you that my playthrough is a back-to-back playthrough of the original and Scholar of the First Sin. I will do a section in the original and then literally loop back oh, and man, man. in the same session play that second part in Scholar to sort of go through the differences in my mind going into it, they were more drastic than they proved to be in actual play. Mm -hmm. There there were differences and some of them were definitely making it harder. Um, but to your notion that everything feels off, I agree a hundred percent. And I will tell you, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find the video to link to it, but somebody actually did a breakdown of how the character dodge rolls and things like that. And actually demonstrates like it's different in ways that are worse. Like you can only when you roll it, it, it's like compass directions or something like it can only do certain things because you can't do that. I'll see if I can find the video. But um, my biggest problem with Dark Souls 2 was when I played through it, I was like, yeah, it feels off. The the swings feel off. I don't move right. Um, Everything feels weird. It doesn't the, the moment to moment combat, which was so good in. In Demon Souls, the original end, but really in Dark Souls, just feels off. And mm. I, I think it's like a different engine. I thought the graphics looked like crap sometimes. Like it could, like when you're in Majula, it's beautiful. But you go just about anywhere else and you get up close, like all the textures look like crap. I don't know. It just, mm. it really, I, I still beat it. And because at the time that was, there was no other Souls I could, you know, I guess I could have replaced one. But, um. That was my biggest problem was that I just, it felt wrong and I never got used to it. And I personally can't put my finger on it, but I know that people have done extensive where all the great critical thinking is done. YouTube videos (laughs) on (laughs) what, um, what, how it's different and why that feeling is there. And I'll see if I can find some to link to. Yeah. And I think bonfire side chat. I've also, I've not played, I've not looked into I should do like a video recap of two just so I know what happens. But I think their takeaway is like, here's an important recap, or maybe I don't remember who did the video. Someone did the video. And it's like, here's the important recap of Dark Souls lore. Then Dark Souls 2 happened. And here's Dark Souls 3 lore. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter is my understanding. Right. Uh, but I will say like to what the article says, like the people who like it, love it. And I think, <laughs> I don't know if that's sort of like the way people sort of dig in when they have an unpopular opinion. But, um, you know, there's, um, if you follow games journalism at all, there's, uh, somebody that I respected a lot. Um, Well, I still respect him. His name is Austin Walker. He got a start with giant bomb, which is a website for a while. Uh, I think he was running, I think he was like the editor in chief of like, um, the video games 
stuff for Vice for a little bit. So, and he's he's a big proponent of Dark Souls too. I think even Bonfire Side Chat they like Dark Souls two more than three. I think they'll defend. It's kind of the vibe that I'm getting from them. Yeah. So yeah, Which I think the people wild. that really like Dark Souls two, I think what they'll often say is the mechanics are not as bad as you think. And the lore is more interesting than you're giving it credit for. Hmm. Um, and I confess it's the one I, because I didn't enjoy playing the game so much, I didn't go back and then really deep dive into everything I could. So sure. that could be fair. All right. What's up next? I guess after Dark Souls 2, that's what we were just talking about, right? Yeah. Dark Souls 3, yep. um, an accessible and poetic part of the Dark Souls series. Well, Bloodborne. Bloodborne was next. Oh, that was before. Oh, right, right. You're right. Yeah, that, yeah. I always mm -hmm. forget that came before. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. I don't know why in my head it's not that way, but it, it is. Um, so, yeah. So, Bloodborne says the uh, our diehards, Blood, Bloodborne diehards are a special crowd, refined, intense, and mysterious types. These are the romantics and mystics of the Soulsborne community. If Bloodborne is your favorite game, you are a passionate soul, you love hard, <laughs> and you fight for what you love even harder. You're likely a night owl, <laughs> a Lovecraftian, and love Lovecraftian literature, gothic architecture, and have great taste in fashion. Yeah. It you might frequently contemplate existential concepts and are very ambitious. Okay. Tell me a little bit about that. What do you think? Oh, I think it's fair. Um, I think it's a little broad, but um, it is it is a change of pace, right? Like we have, and this article says it well. And again, just uh, this we're pulling this from the gamer, yeah. a wonderful, fun article from Abigail Longy. Go check it out. Um, and they mentioned that this is very aggressive combat, right? But then this is pre Sekiro, which is <laughs> even like more aggressive it's, combat, right? Um. Yeah, Sekiro is Bloodborne combat on like Angel Dust. It's <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's I aggressive. Could where, I could see like if your roots to this are Dark Souls and Demon right. Souls, and then maybe Dark Souls Two, and then they do Bloodborne. Um, but my path was different, right? So I will say it is a gorgeous game, and fashion is everything in that game. Um, yes. Yeah, the so armor important. sets don't matter. It very rarely. Right. Very rarely. It's like sometimes you might want a particular type of resistance, but even then, it's non-existent. You wear what makes you feel good. Uh, kind of like when you were in middle school band, and it's like, oh yeah, we dress up for band performances because you perform better when you look nice. Well, it's the same thing with Bloodborne. Um, <laughs> right. you, you slay you slay the old ones better when you're when you're wearing a fucking <laughs> head piece that's 10 feet tall right, right. i mean um yeah there's a reason yeah, why I, in in the matrix they didn't wear ll bean chinos right they <laughs> <laughs> exactly style that's matters right. well but they could have you know a little form <laughs> a little function over form i'm sure there's something to be said about that like maybe don't wear the metal cage on your head and bloodborne <laughs> or do you all right next up dark souls 3 yeah an accessible and poetic part of the dark Souls series that if this is your favorite installment you might be a bit of a dreamer or an artistic type and have a curious nature. You probably appreciate art, lean towards sentimentality, and love a good challenge as much as you love a good story. You probably also have a tendency to daydream and restless need to know everything about anything that attracts your interest. You may be more social than other Soulsborne players before you play your favorite game with a circle of friends, especially ones you want to in introduce to the franchise. And then importantly here, Dark Souls 3 poetically ties the trilogy together. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is DLCs, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we will. I will just say that the DLCs of Bloodborne 3 are maybe the most important things, additions lore-wise. A Dark Souls 3, right, right. The, yeah. Yeah. Like, they are, and they're amazing. Mm-hmm. A uh, big fan of both of them. I think this is fair of Dark Souls 3. Yeah. Um, I will say the social thing is kind of interesting because, yeah, it was one of the early ones where you could set your passwords, even though Bloodborne did that first. Um, but I, I think what. Uh, so, OK, so the article, you know, it says it sort of they say like it romantically ties the trilogy together. 
Yeah, poetically. Yeah. Poetically, yeah, yeah. So that is something that a lot of hardcore fans actually don't like. And so I think hmm. if you... I could see if you do prefer Dark Souls 3 the most, I could see that requiring a sort of romantic embrace of of the first game, but not a strict adherence to the way they describe Dark Souls 1 fans as the traditionalists. Um, you have to be willing to let go of that a little bit. Yeah. But still, yeah, still have that sort of romantic, you know, ideal of, of that world and the lore and... and so when a callback occurs, it's it's good. It's not just derivative, which I right. think is what a lot of people complain about. Yeah, that's something we're going to talk about for sure, because I think that's a sticking point for, for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, next is going to be, I guess we're up to Sekiro, right? Yeah. All right, so Sekiro, you're probably the last person you want to mess with. Objective and strategic, you are devoted to your purpose. So you neither of us are Sekiro. <laughs> like, just from a person, not like a favorite game, because Sekiro is beautiful and gorgeous. Yes. And man, when you get it, it's so satisfactory. But like, from personality, this is neither of us. No, no, no. Sorry, no. Um, uh, objective and strategic, you are devoted to your purpose. Beet juice. I don't remember anything. <laughs> what day is it? Who's the president? And you can hold a grudge for a lifetime. Duty and self-discipline are important to you. You call out things as they are and value truthfulness. You know your priorities and refuse to settle for less than what you expect to achieve. Uh, yeah, you prob you're probably in touch with your roots and deeply introspective. You're not very talkative, but close relationships are really important to you. Now, you've played more Sekiro than I have, and I can mm -hmm. get into why I bounced off of Sekiro in a bit. But I, So I, I don't know if I can speak to any of this. I have to confess. Yeah, I mean, again, these are all like broad things, but they're fun. Um it's very much a, a story about honor. Um, and it's also a very different way of approaching combat. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can brute force things in Dark Souls. Just about just every other game. fucking poise and throw on a fucking club and just smash to town. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to play. And it's so broken in Dark Souls. <laughs> um, Oonga Boonga build is, is the best. There's That's not here. No. You are forced into a play style much more than you're forced into a play style with Bloodborne. Now, Bloodborne, you need to use, you don't have to, but you need to use the guns for uh, parries and interrupts. Um, yeah, you have a firearm, and instead of blocking with a shield, you can shoot them in the face and it interrupts <laughs> them uh, if you haven't played Bloodborne. Yeah. This is very much about throwing your shield up at exactly the right time to get a deflection and going for the attack. Right. And then typically dealing enough damage to them to open up a killing blow. Now, like basic enemies, you can just kill without that like visceral attack. But generally, a boss you, or or a, a lead enemy, you're like breaking their poise to a you're attacking them enough to open them up for that critical hit. And so bosses will generally have big health bars, and then you have to knock those health bars down, you know, five or six times or something like that. But um, yeah, right. it's it's a beautiful game. I've never beaten it. Um, right. I've there's in my playthrough on my PS4, I'm stuck on a boss that I can't get past. And then I have a lot of fun doing the PC streams. I just, it's something yeah. new and shiny got my eye. And I will say like, so to, to what's your point, you know, like Unka Bunga, you just grab something big and you smash the shit out of it. Yeah. Works basically in every single game. And even in Bloodborne, which, you know, they're trying to push a very specific type of aggressive combat. Because, yeah, you can get a fucking cannon. <laughs> right, right. And there are pairing, but I feel like the windows for the, the gun are a little, a little bit more forgiving than Sekiro. Yes, absolutely. And you heal when you take damage. If you immediately hit back, yep. you get some of your your hit points back. So it encourages. It, it can encourage like an Ungabunga style if you want it to. It doesn't have to be, you know, it, it can fit in with how you were playing other games, even though that's not how I play Souls games, which is why I sometimes struggled with Bloodborne. If you play a hard, aggressive Ungabunga kind of smash shit build, you can take that into Bloodborne. Sekiro is the only one where I think it really requires a very specific style of gameplay that like feels very elite. You know, it's very mm -hmm. exact, like you were describing, exact timing. Like the people that can just parry everything, they're going to be fine in Sekiro. But if you're not one of those kinds of players, I can just parry at will. And like, I'm not, I'm not a good dancer. I don't have good timing. I can't get it that perfect. And so yeah. 
I wanted to play Sekiro so badly. It introduces some stealth mechanics. It's got verticality with like its grappling hook. It does a lot of really cool mm-hmm. things. It's an amazing story. And and yeah, apparently it has an amazing story. And I just I I'm just not built in a way like I can't roll my R's. Mm-hmm. There's certain things I can't do. I can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Sekiro. <laughs> right. I I can't do that, and I can't get the timing precise enough. Yeah. So this article nails it. It's the combat is tailored to reward memorization and patience and that, um, and even when you get it down and I remember one boss in particular, um, is just so much and it's, uh, it's at the top of a tower. I I won't spoil this one since you haven't played it. I'll just spoil it for the people that listen to us, (laughs) but not you buddy. Um, in that moment and he has these lightning attacks. And when I finally got the pairing done there and just, like fucking smoked it, you know, after several attempts, bang, 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 bang. And then you get it. It's so satisfying. But at the same time, even like, then I have it, right? Like, I feel like, okay, I've got this game. I know what I'm doing. Um, and then I get to this next boss and I bash my head against it for weeks, Mm -hmm. right? Going back and back to it. And I never get it. Um, and then I spend, take some time off from it. And then I try to come back to it and there's like, oh, there's no, if I didn't get it in that moment when I was good, I'm never getting it again right. because I don't have patience. <laughs> like, that's the thing. Like I can do the memorization and I can kind of get the timing down. I'm not, a, I haven't beaten. I'm not a fucking pro, right. but I'm also not patient and I will brute force a lot of bosses um, and get very greedy. Like I, I am a greedy player. If there's one more swing left, even if I'm out of stamina, I'm going for the swing. Right. Right. And, you know, I've heard some people describe Sekiro. It's more of like a rhythm game than a Dark Souls game, which yeah, you can probably see it that way. Yeah. I mean, I get what they're trying to say. And so it's <laughs> what, what's that? Well, I just saw like an argument the other day when someone was like, uh, oh, yeah, Boreal Dancer, Dancer of the Boreal Valley in Dark Souls 3. Amazing fight. Uh, people don't like it because the fight is in three, three fourths time. And then someone fucking chimed in and was like, it's actually more in like six eighths time. And I think they were serious. And they had all these examples of it. And I'm just like, okay, but if you just put a fucking club on and hit her in the face, like it's <laughs> it'll go down time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And circling back to something we said sort of at the very beginning, these games do require a get good investment. Um, and what I've always appreciated about souls games is that they give you different paths to get good. Bloodborne yeah. takes away most of those paths, but you can still Hulk smash and, you can brute force you can level up and get tons of health yeah i felt like sekiro was the first one that's like there's only (laughs) one way to do this and you got to do it perfectly oh yeah no get good no i mean get good pick up your sticks son get good right in this exact way nope you can't you can't switch your build i'm sorry you can't uh try a different approach it has to be this approach and it has to be perfect and that's the exact get good you need to be yeah i don't know if that's fair you can like tools you can utilize and like some people may not use them or not. So like there is a little variance there. I don't want to say it's like, there's only one approach. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the deal, and this goes back to my other point is like, but in like dark souls or bloodborne or whatever, it's get good. And then once you're good, just don't get lazy. Right. Cause right. It, like souls games will humble you in an instant. Mm. Right. Like you'll be on world one, one and you just get destroyed by some wild, fucking guy with a flaming sword and he's just like a regular peasant and he just like just smokes you right and it's just like fuck and it's because you got lazy and you didn't respect the game yeah. so it requires you to stay good and get a little bit better but it, it felt like with Sekiro it's like all right you you got good okay well now get good again <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> uh, that's at least how it felt to me all yeah. right so we have one more and that is Elden Ring the Explorer yeah. You're an adventurous, open-minded person who enjoys traveling, exploring, meeting new people, and trying new things. You might also appreciate surprises more than some of your peers. The open, inviting, battle-hungry world of Elden Ring is just right for you. You keep your interests diverse, your aspirations high, and are fun to hang out with. Um, and then they, they didn't find this as the most successful, and that's probably true. Um, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a double-edged sword. I think it is... But it's not going to help you get there. It gives you tools, I think, to make it the most accessible. But mm. you have to go. It's not going to hold your hand in order to find those tools. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Okay. Uh, you want to guess what the other... Are we guessing based off what their pick a favorite game is? 
Or are we be guessing based off the personality description? Okay. Um, well, th I think that's the trouble. I, I think I know which ones you're... F well, you know what? I, I, it would, I, I know two of them that you really like. I don't know which one you would mark as your favorite, though. Mm. Um, so how about this? I'll guess what I think your favorite is. And then okay. I'll guess which one I think based on your... The personality, if they're different, sure. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I would say, if I had to guess that, your favorite is Bloodborne. And then some of the things that I heard when they were describing Dark Souls 3, which I would guess, if I didn't guess Bloodborne, I would guess Dark Souls 3. Um, nice. I would nice. say, personality-wise, I would say Dark Souls 3. Yeah, so actually, personality-wise, I think you're dead on. When I hear that, I hear a lot of stuff in myself, Dark Souls 3. Um... So I went, the last time I played Bloodborne was 2023. And I finished up the Platinum, which means finishing up the Chalice Dungeons, which the more Ooh. I think about Chalice Dungeons, the more upset I get because they're such a core part of the lore that you yeah. don't realize. Um, the blood for the Healing Church comes from the Chalice Dungeons. Yarnum is built upon these Chalice Dungeons and the, they go down and explore and extract it. And it, it unleashes all the hell on Yarnum. Hmm. Uh, basically, it introduces a miracle drug that ends up causing uh, all the people to turn into fucking beasts, <laughs> let alone all the cosmic shit going on. Yeah. And that's amazing. But you, to me, the Chalice Dungeons are like, oh, well, let's pad out this game a little bit more. So that being said, I did like a complete final thing. I've not finished the DLC for Bloodborne. Um, and I just should at some point. I've just been stuck on one boss and then need to get good again. Um from a grand lore perspective yes bloodborne is my favorite from an all-around package dark souls 3 is my favorite <laughs> yeah yeah um i love the a little more overt poetic epic ending to it all especially if you put in the DLCs. Oh yeah. Um, and I really, you need the, you need painted world for ring city. Um, because everything Gale does, which is kill until the end of the world, um, only matters for making a, a new, you know, painted world and right. collecting enough of the dark soul. That's a whole lot of lore to unpack that you don't really need to focus on. I love that. And then when I think about the music, and there's amazing music in Bloodborne. There's amazing. It's like 1A, 1B is what I'll say. It's just more of the diverse weapons in the beautiful, beautiful world. And Bloodborne is beautiful at times, too. But um, when I think of the bosses, and I think of the music, and I think of the set pieces, mm. they are almost equal, but Dark Souls 3 edges it out. All right, interesting. So I was wrong on the which was your favorite. But my second choice, you felt like nailed the personality part. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. All right. Do me, do me, do me. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think your I think your favorite is Elden Ring, like game. Mm -hmm. And I think your personality, I don't know if your personality is Elden Ring. I'll say hmm. I think your personality is Demon Souls. Mm. But if not that, then Dark Souls. But I'll, I'll I'll commit and I'll say your favorite is maybe Elden Ring and your personality is Demon Souls. Okay. Uh that actually that that sounds pretty good. So I, I'm often but here's where you're wrong, motherfucker. Right, right. You couldn't be more wrong. I hate all these games. <laughs> um I don't know why I played them all for the channel. This is shit. Um no no no. Um Yes, I will say, having just completed Shadows of the Earth Tree, um, that playthrough is coming up on the channel. I've beaten the game, but the the ending chapters will come out in the next couple of weeks at the time of this recording. But um, I, I think it is my favorite. But let me let me couch it this way. Um, I, I don't think it's my it's my favorite. But here's why. Um, if I had to say what's my favorite traditional Souls game, it would be Demon Souls. And it's partly because it's my first, partly because of um, those things that I felt when I first played it. The ground that I felt like it was breaking in terms of video games as a whole. It was the first dark fantasy series that really ever like spoke to me in a way. 
Um, Elden Ring is my favorite Skyrim. Um, so I mm. don't know if it's my favorite Souls game. Yeah. But I, my favorite style of game is co-op open world. If there's open world in particular, but if you allow co-op, like the most recent Ghost Recon games, like Wildlands and um, Breakpoint, you, you put, you give me an open world and I will explore the shit out of it. I just, I'm always that person that like, I wonder what's on the other side of this hill. Can I get up to that cave? Maybe it's almost like a compulsion. Mm. Um, but I don't like the combat in Elder Scrolls games. Um, oh, I just, well, I, you said L, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> no, no, I, I just, I just don't like the combat in Elder yep. Scrolls games. Right. So Elden Ring sort of gave me the open world adventure I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's souls though. Um, it is because think, it's it's got all the trappings, like the the really good environmental storytelling, the really in depth lore, um, and maybe it's just such a staggering achievement that I'm not like to be able to do everything that like this intricate, deep, complex, crunchy lore on the scope of Skyrim is maybe just something I can't quite get my head around, um, and so sometimes I'm like. Uh, maybe my favorite souls is demon souls because it's, I, I can digest it um, yeah. where Elden ring. I'm just in awe of just about every moment of it. Um, and, but, but mainly the thing that drives me through it is exploring, not the classic, you know, mm. things you look for in a souls game, getting to that next boss, that feeling when you beat it and your hands are shaking. Although that was the case when I beat <laughs> the DLC. So, I couldn't agree more other than I'm only an explorer for so long. Mm -hmm. And then I just like give up on that shit. <laughs> um, and when I was younger, it was different, right? Like when I only had Vice City, I played the shit out of Vice City. Right. But like now with Red Dead Redemption 2, which checks so many boxes mm -hmm. and I get halfway through it and then I don't pick it up for a couple of months because real life gets in the way. And then I go right. back to it and I'm just like, huh? Like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm terrible about that. So right. that, the the saving grace for me with Elden Ring and Elden Ring is an amazing game yeah and I I do I love that thing it's one C right yeah um, <laughs> the saving grace for Elden Ring where something like New Horizons missed for me mm. is how digestible Elden Ring is in its pieces right meaning I can get a it's a daunting task to, to play through Elden Ring, but it's a very easy task to go play through, you know, pick a section. Right, right. Right, you know, like you can do a little bit and get that close enough feeling, but you're right, it's not. And I'm not a, I'm not a purist because my path after Bloodborne was a little bit of Dark Souls, a good chunk of Dark Souls, mm -hmm. and then stop for a little bit. And then Elden Ring, and then Dark Souls 3, and then a deep dive into Dark Souls. Oh, interesting. Right. So like even my, when I played Dark Souls 3, a lot of that appreciation, there were references that I didn't understand. Uh, especially like when I watched you play the expansion to Dark Souls 1, like I was like, oh, this looks familiar. And like, I didn't even know Ulysseal was a place, right? Uh, other than like <laughs> right. obscure references. It's like, oh, this really is Ulysseal. Like no, <laughs> no wonder why it looks familiar. Um, anyways, that's its saving grace. If it was just an open world game that was like, just run across the plane. I, I don't know. It, it works for me when open world games don't at work for me as often anymore, as much as I want them to. So, right. I, I will say like, or we both have families, jobs, kids, whatever, you know, I actually don't have time in my life for just open world games for the sake of open world games. And so it, it's, it takes something like co-op, which is why I was able to get through the ghost recon games. I just mentioned, or it takes something to get me to give it the time mm -hmm. um, because it is such an opportunity cost for not just other games, but like, you know, things I could be doing around the house or things, you know, I could be, you know, binging a show with my wife and spending time with my kid, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, at this point in my life, like there's a huge opportunity cost for an open world game. And um, it really, I, I can't just give it to anything. So Elden yeah. Ring showed me that 
there there was it just it really pulled me along the whole way through and I've played it twice so it wasn't just that I've that's how much it grabbed me um mm-hmm. and it gave me the exploration I wanted and just with everything that I love about souls and it never for me it never dropped the ball it's never like oh this is the lazy part of the story or you know it just it, it held a pretty high standard Mm -hmm. across the entirety of its world for me yeah yeah i think for me it's like the first half is gold Mm -hmm. then you have the mount i want to say mount doom that's not right no but i know what you mean that where you get up to the snowy no the fire shit yeah with the the house and the murder mystery shit going on oh okay yeah like it, it, it kind of goes up and down for me after that. Like once you get in the main city, I love it. And then like in game stuff. And then when you get in the snowy mountains, it kind of dips a little bit again. Anyways. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I will say this to bring it back to mine, to make it all about me with dark souls three. That was the only time I wanted a new game plus. Oh, interesting. Um, because I'm not above save scumming to get all the endings. Nice. And not having to replay the game <laughs> again. Lazy gamer. Nice. Very um, nice. I mean, Bloodborne, I just reset. Like, I didn't want to do New Game Plus um, because I didn't want that in difficulty. But Dark Souls 3 was immediate. Like, I didn't want it to end. Let's let's go again. Nice. Um, But I think we have a lot to talk about in the future, which is going to be really awesome. We're going to be able to dive into detail. We're going to talk about boss fights, uh, weapons. I mean, there's so much we can talk about lore, boss lore. I mean, it's, it's just wild. Yeah. Um, how much detail we could go into these games. Plus the minute by Natu- minute watchings of every single thing. I was, of I was about to say, now <laughs> we'll also have to deal with interruptions as we watch Blue Velvet uh, <laughs> and talk about the connections between Bloodborne and Kyle McLaughlin's character in Blue Velvet. <laughs> um, they're there, folks. They're there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so this was a lot of fun. Yeah. So thank you for your time. Our listeners, if you're checking this out, I don't know if this, we haven't quite decided this is going to go on a separate feed where this is going to go, but it will be out there available for you somewhere living. And this will be a, a thing we continue to explore as we dive into this wonderful world of from soft um, and do some cool shit. I'm looking forward to it very much. So, yeah, I, and uh, yeah, I appreciate it for, uh, uh, for doing this. There was Patrick was never going to be able to jump in on this. So I'm glad we were able to no, figure no. out a way to pull it off. Nope. Nope. But we'll force him to listen to it. So oh, then yeah. he gets interested. <laughs> Clockwork yeah. Orange style, baby. Remember, didn't Paul buy uh, one of these? What did he buy? Uh, a bunch of people jumped on Elden Ring. It wasn't Elden Ring, though. Was it? I feel it like wasn't. he bought one of these and I was like, oh, hell yeah. Was it Bloodborne, maybe? Oh, maybe. Maybe. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's good stuff. Anyway. All right. Well, folks, that's going to do it for us. There's going to be a link down to our Discord in the show notes if you want to come talk about uh, video games, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, any of the Soulsborne, any video games. Yeah. Um, come pop in. It's a, it's a great discussion. Today, we were trying to find dog names that were either Twin Peaks or hmm. Soulsborne related, and uh, don't tell my wife, but we landed on Luna only because I was like, well, Pale Moon, Luna, good enough for me. <laughs> nice. Does she yeah. know that? I mean, does she know it's Luna and where it came from? No, no. Okay. Because I tried Yosef, Yosef, Yosefska. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yosefska. Good thing we didn't fucking pick that. And that was like a no, no deal. So I was like, okay, what about Gwendolyn? And we could call her Gwen. Nope. That uh, didn't mm. fly either. I was like, well, I'm yeah. running out of. Then I thought, I thought uh, Ranny was really going to say, go be like, or we call her Ronnie and just spell it R A N N I. And nope. <laughs> didn't quite sneak it past. Nope. Oh, well. No, nope, she wasn't having it. So nice. Awesome. So, hey, yeah, come pop in the Discord. Let me find a dog name, but we're yeah, settled yeah. on it now. So, the next dog. Yeah. And also, in the, obviously, in the Discord roster, we're talking about tabletop RPGs as well. Yep. It's all sorts of stuff. So, awesome. All right, all right folks. That's going to do it for us. Have a good night. Take care. The music during the RPG session in Foundry was provided by the Foundry module Tabletop RPG Music and composed by Ian Fisher. You can find his Patreon at www.patreon.com slash tabletoprpgmusic, all one word.